of all, Amy, I want to thank you for joining us here. Um, we really all appreciate it. We're very grateful of this event, um, so thank you. My name is Andy. I am an occupational therapy student. It is my second year and my second time here. Um, but I wanted to ask you, um, I know we're simulating an interview, seeing you for the first time. So can you tell me a little bit um, about occupational therapy, kind of what you know about occupational therapy? Um, what I know about occupational therapy is that it's mostly therapy that helps you do normal living, thing, you know, living day things like uh, the way you get out of bed, the way you get dressed, fix your breakfast, just everyday living things as opposed to physical therapy, which is more to build up strength. But she didn't ask you about physical. <laughs> 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 That's fine. All right, we're very commonly compared to one another, so okay. I was expecting that. Um, but yeah, you hit the nail right on the head. We really look at the person's whole <coughs> being, and we want to focus on things that they want to do, that they need to do, like get out of bed, feed yourself, and things that um, you're expected to do as well. So any of those things that you talked about, like getting out of bed, making food, any of those that you find are difficult throughout your day? There's a lot of things that's difficult things. throughout my day. <laughs> Maybe the top, the top three most difficult things. Um, I would say getting out of bed is difficult. Um, I'd stiff for probably about half an hour to 45 minutes. Um, I usually shower in the morning because it helps throwing warm water helps with the stiffness. Um, I would say the second thing is um, doing a lot of doing stairs. Uh, I get short of breath easily. Um, so that's, that's something that's difficult. And I would say the third thing that is difficult would be um, opening jars, uh, opening pop bottles, it has a twist lid or buttons, um, so I have the dexterity to do that kind of thing. Yeah. So I'm going to pause because I want to comment on, on what's happening as we are going through. So that's the other beauty of simulation is you can always stop and talk about things. You're doing awesome. Um, uh, what did she do well? A couple things she did really well. She asked her, what do you know about uh, OT? And then she left off of that and said, you're right, it's the whole person. So tell me some of the things that are difficult to do for you. And Amy gave a very true response. A lot of things are difficult for me. But are you going to be able to cover all of those things in one visit? You're not. You're not. So I really like that idea of tell me your top three. And maybe that's what you concentrate on during this visit is how can I help you with those top three things? Okay, really key piece of information that she got from an interprofessional education perspective is she found out she can't open jars, right? So we're going to want to make sure that that goes into our record and gets to our pharmacist. Okay. So good job. Go right back in like I never stop. <laughs> okay, um, so you talked about the difficulty with stairs. Now, how is your home set up? Do you have to go downstairs to get to the kitchen? Is your room on the second floor, or the first floor? What kind of stairs do you use throughout the day? Um, we're lucky enough in my house that it's, um, it's a ranch, so the downstairs is really only for laundry, and um, my dad does that. So. <laughs> um, and then there's only um, a couple, like three steps to get up to my room, and they're small, so I can do that. But there's a big step um, to get into the house. Um, <coughs> like a steep step. So um, as more along, as I get older, and as, if I do get sicker, we'll have to figure out something for that. Yeah, absolutely. We will um, address that throughout our time together um, to make sure that we can prevent any difficulties if that is needed. Um, um, jars, the jars you mentioned. <laughs> So, um, yes, occupational therapy works a lot with adaptive equipment. Um, are you aware of this a little bit? Excellent. So we have a lot of cool, funky things that we can use and we can invent ourselves. Is there anything like that that you use at home now? Um, yeah, I have like um, a little nifty pop bottle opener or pop can opener. Um, I have, 
kind of really want to use the built up forks and knives because they're kind of not really nice. Not ready. Yeah, so <laughs> I kind of just bought knives, forks, and spoons that have bigger hand handles. Mm -hmm. So I use them. Um, and then I have like little things that go on your pencils to make them easier to grip. Um, and then we have the other part of the nifty pop can opener is a uh, pop bottle opener. Um, and like for cans and stuff, um, they have those, uh, now that you can, you can kind of do little split with things, but mm -hmm. I just use a regular can opener and just bust it all up. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, you find ways. Excellent. Well, I'd love to open some jars with you someday and <laughs> figure out. <laughs> for me? Yeah, or for you. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> you want to pause? Yeah. Okay, great. That was awesome. Uh, that was great. So, so this, yay! Um, what I really liked about this is that, that question. Here's some open-ended question, and here's my follow-up. Right. So she went in with it. Um, Amy offered that she doesn't like to use the built-up forks and knives. Right. But she might have just stopped there and said, I don't like using them. And then what would be the next question? What don't you like about them? What maybe are some other things that we could do? I get that, you know? So I thought that was that was great. That was really great. And it gave you an opportunity to, to follow up. So just never forget that you're getting a little piece of information. How can you take it further? How can you help this patient? That's the goal. And what I liked about what you did is you didn't have, even though you're up there and you're like, okay, I'm in front of this huge group of people and I've got my list of questions, you still tailored them based on what you were hearing. And that is key to good interviewing. And I want you to be thinking as we're going through, because we'll talk to the audience, uh, what are some more inf pieces of information that we want to make sure she shares with the rest of the interprofessional team? Okay? And I happen to know that he has lots of other nifty things, because her dad is a nifty guy. <laughs> so nifty things, but we'll talk about that after. I'm Brittany. I'm, uh, I'm with Nutrition. I'm a dietetic intern. So I just had a question. How has your diagnosis affected your relationship with food? Do you want that? Here. <laughs> oh. so I, I can talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I tried really hard to not let it affect my relationship with food. Um, I think that with scleroderma, there's a lot of things that you don't have control over. So I like to have control over what I eat. But it has been tough um, because my body doesn't like certain things that it used to like. Mm -hmm. And what type of things? Well, I get a lot of um, acid reflux, so uh, <coughs> tomato sauce, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> spicy stuff, which I used to love to eat. So yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I stay away from caffeine. Um, I'm supposed to stay away from soda, but I don't. So I'm not, not going to give it up. <laughs> uh, do you, are there certain things that you have trouble swallowing? Um, yeah, meat, uh, like steak and stuff like that is hard to cut and chew and swallow. So I avoid um, things like that. And like burgers and things that are like a big sandwich, I would probably cut up meat with a fork because mm -hmm. um, I can't shove like a whole, you know. Like I used to shovel. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, you can't really do that anymore. So things like that, I've had to modify a little bit. Yeah. Have you had trouble eating like larger meals? Definitely. Yeah. Um, you feel full quicker. Um, at least I do. Mm -hmm. So I tend to eat. I tend to kind of graze all day long. That's great. Just eat a little bit at a time. Yeah. That's great. Do you have um, trouble? with certain like do you get dry mouth or dry like throat mm -hmm. with certain things so i get i have dry mouth and dry eye a lot so mm -hmm. um i couldn't just eat like a saltine i would need i usually need something to drink with yeah. when I, I try to have something to drink when i have something to eat just to help everything go down and yeah. so i'm not like choking and people have to give me behind oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not good it's <laughs> not good so yeah, I try to do that. So it's been difficult. Yeah, kind of trial and error. Yeah, for you. just trial and error. Yeah. Are there things that you notice that like upset your stomach? Other than I know you were saying spicy foods and you kind of get the acid reflux. But. Um, food-wise, 
Um, there's not really a lot of stuff that like upset my stomach. Um, but medication wise there is a yeah. lot of things that upset my stomach. Um, like antibiotics and stuff, they don't really do well. Yeah. Um, but food wise, because I graze, I'm not like sitting down and eating like a whole big meal or something, so I think that's kind of why I don't really get upset stomach from too many different things. Yeah. I'm not really eating like right. I'm not really gorging myself on it. Mm -hmm. So that's great. It's yeah. I'm glad you like learned your you know, your ways. <laughs> Yeah. So get enough food that you need. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'm going to take a pause. Hi. Yes. Yeah. So I really love that first question. How has your diagnosis changed your relationship with food? And what Amy gave was something that was like, it's actually one of her sacred places, right? A little bit. It's one of the things that she's had to adapt to a lot of things. This is not probably somebody that you're going to hit really hard to give up soda. And it's Amy, so it's not going to work. Okay? Uh, but she makes that really clear. Um, but she does say, but I have given up coffee, or I've given up caffeine except for the soda. Good. Well, I'm glad you did that, and let's make sure that we're managing it. But I think you know you have to realize how far can you take a patient? How much can you ask them to adjust? And I thought that that really that initial question gave you a really really good piece of information. Um, and then asking the questions that are key to slurred down. Well, can you swallow? I really like that she said. Well, I'm glad you've learned that by grazing you're not having problems with your stomach. So that again. That's encouraging. You always want to tell them something that they're doing well. You want to congratulate them on the changes that they've made that are supportive to them. Because if you don't do that, they're never going to work on having maybe one less pop a day. I don't know. She's number one. She's number one. She's number one. Um, so you have to start small, right? You have, to, yeah, you have to start small. And I think that that was key. And I think you set yourself up that way really nicely. You also were like, you were smiling when she's smiling. You know, Amy has a really fantastic sense of humor. Only Amy can make a joke about the Heimlich maneuver. And the whole group of people laugh. Um, and it's all teens. But, um, that's really key. Make sure that you're seeing the patient that you're with and that if that humor is one of the things they use, let her and, and go with that. So I thought that was that was great. Did you have more questions? Are you ready to move no, on? That's fine. Okay. Yeah. And you're gonna pass on to the pharmacist what piece of information? Um that antibiotics upset. So that would be something you would want to make sure that you're able to pass forward to your interprofessional team. Okay? All right, next. So I'm Ron, I'm a pharmacy student. I just want to know, how are you feeling? Are you feeling okay? That's great. That's great. Is there anything that is has been bothering you more than or anything was? Anything that you've noticed that's really been bothering you more than normal? Um, well, I had foot surgery about a month ago. Okay. I got a staph infection from that surgery. So I was in the hospital for three days. Okay. And so now I have to do wound care, so that's bugging me a little bit. <laughs> and <laughs> how, is, yeah. how is the wound? Is healing okay? Um, it's slowly healing. Um, people with sclerotic don't have <coughs> very good circulation, so um, it's a process. Yeah, of course, I get it. Um, about your pain, did you say you have pain? Yep. Did you, have you tried anything to help you with the pain? Yeah, I'm on general. Okay. Um, so we're doing that, and um, I take narcotics just for uh, functionality, like everyday pain. So between that and the Tamarol, it's been pretty um, manageable. Okay, okay. And how how well is the, the medication set up? Is it, is it okay? Is it easy to take? Is it affecting you in any way, giving you any symptoms, or? Um, no, um, I'm pretty used to narcotics. Um, I personally have gotten a lot of uh, digital ulcers and ulcerative sores, narcotics issue, so um, I'm used to events. Okay. Are you doing anything to kind of, because you said digital, so your finger mm -hmm. ulcers. Are you doing anything to kind of help with that? Like preventative? Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, it works just to kind of keep the skin dry. Um, and uh, so I try to like moisturize, but not 
over moisturize um, to keep them warm. So uh, obviously when it gets cold out, I'm doing good <coughs> moves um, so that, and I take um, basal violators yep. to help yep. circulation. So I do that. And um, it's kind of like regimen for now. <laughs> that's okay. I if it's working, that's great. Yeah. That's a great thing. And you should continue to do what's working. <coughs> and if you see an issue, then you should definitely talk to a pharmacist. Do you have do you have a pharmacist that you normally go to, one that you kind of trust and you go to all the time? Because I know that's yeah. a very important thing, especially in this situation. Because somebody you trust, you trust and who knows you exactly. Yeah. Because it's different with a whole bunch of patients. Every patient experiences it differently. Yeah. So therefore, somebody who really knows you is going to be able to help you best. Yeah. Well, I take, I would say, like, between 25 and 30 pills a day, so um, about about 15 to 18 different medications. So um, me and my pharmacist are very tight. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. We're on a first name basis. <laughs> she is lovely. Well, that's great. Do you do you have a method of keeping track of all your medications? Is um, it like maybe, you know, separating it between the little push-out tabs or, or putting it into a pill box where you kind of keep the organization? Because I know that could be sometimes a little yeah. hectic to, to I maintain have, everything. Um, I have a monthly, three monthly pill boxes. So I give me up, um, I, take, I take them four times a day. Um, so I give you those up and then I also have a uh, a list of medications, um, dosage, and when I take them in my phone. Um, and then, well, my parents have a list that they keep in their wallets. My sister and my brother have a list that they keep in their wallets. And I have one that I keep in my purse in case. But That's great. That really is great. Because you definitely need to make sure that you keep track so that you don't double up on dose, take you know, too many or anything like that. And you definitely want to make sure that you have it available to give to anybody who might need it and that other people, just in case of an emergency, has a list of your medications that they can give. Because that is very important to prevent any interactions or anything that could potentially harm you, which is the goal of, I'd say, everybody on this panel, is to prevent harm and to best treat. Right. So, let's just take a pause there because that's like a totally natural place. Thank you. You guys are great. So, the thing I want to comment on here is that he didn't ask what we would maybe consider a pharmacy based question by saying, How have you been doing? She even said, she even said Oh, you mean medication wise? And he said, No, I mean overall. And found out about the staff infection in the book. Right? That's a really key piece of information. Uh, how are you managing pain? How are the antibiotics going for that? So, so remember that asking those questions that might not be so specific to your specialty are important because you've gained a lot of information. Um, Amy's a super awesome savvy patient who has medication for this and all of her family members' <laughs> purses and wallets. I love that, right? I don't know. I don't know that I would have thought to ever do that. And I like that you. I like that you asked how she manages it. That's a lot of bills today. It's a lot of bills today. And then you really talked about getting to know your pharmacist and what it means to say on a first name basis, and she's lovely. So you have that power to develop that relationship with the patient. But I really wanted to highlight that first question. You don't always have to hone in on exactly what your specialty is, but a broad question can give you a lot of information that will then relate back to that specialty. Okay, nice, nice job. I so um, my name is Dale. I'm a second year physical therapy student. And just kind of, just to start off, I want to know, what are your feelings about physical therapy? Um, I think physical therapy is great. I've done it a bunch of times. Um, after surgery or um, I had back issues, so I did it for that. Um, I think it helps, but a lot of, well, not a lot of, but some of the exercises, typically the ones that I get, um, are not really geared toward people with scleroderma who can't really bend or um, are stiff. Um, so they're not really modified for somebody who has the kind of illness that people with scleroderma have. 
I could tweak them a little bit. Or my therapist tweaks them a little bit for me. So referring to tweaking your exercises, do you usually feel pretty comfortable talking to your physical therapist about this? Um, yeah, I mean, if she's going to give me something, or he or she is going to give me something that I can't do, I think it's a waste of utilized, um, you know, skill, or it's not going to really do what it's supposed to do to help me. So yeah, I would definitely feel comfortable saying that's not going to work for me. I need something else. So going off the exercises you get at home, referring to your home environment, do you have anyone at home, family or friends, even if not at home nearby, who can help you with anything that you need or who you can call on if you need something? Um, I'm very lucky in that that I have um, both my parents still with me. Um, I live with them and I have a brother and sister who live close by. Um, and I have a good support system of friends, so I have a lot of different people I can call on if I ever need anything uh, help-wise or I need a ride somewhere um, and I can't drive myself, so um, yeah, I think I have a good support system for that. So it's awesome that you have a good support system. It's really important, especially when just progressing through physical therapy, knowing that you have someone there. Um, what do you feel are your biggest limitations? But at the same time, thinking about limitations, with those limitations, what are you still really happy that you can do? Um, my biggest limitation would be um, not being able to walk as far as I normally could, um, getting out of breath quickly, um, it's frustrating. Um, it's frustrating in general not to be able to do anything that you want to do, even if you were a normal person and you were told you could do something, so I think. Um, but I'm happy that um, some of the things that I still love to do, I can do. Um, I quilt with my aunt, so I'm still able to do that. I paint. Um, you know, and I give me some paintbrushes so that they can clear the grip, so I do that. Um, and doing my awareness talking, and um, so I'm still able to do a lot of the things that I love, so. So what's really great about knowing the things that you're still able to do and that you enjoy doing is that we can take those and incorporate those into treatment sessions. So instead of just giving you exercise that you might seem as consistently maybe boring, we can tailor that to you and make it really exciting for you and tailor it to your needs and your lifestyle. And so to kind of end this session is what are your goals? If you could give me some goals and some ideas of what you really want to work on for physical therapy, that would be great. <laughs> um, let's see. So before I had my foot surgery, um, I could knock down a six minute walk pretty fast. You know, like I could do a lot of rotations. Um, so I probably want to work back up to being able to do that. Um, and maybe exceeding how many rotations I did before. Um, and maybe working on some of my fine motor skills would help for those jars and buttons. <laughs> so yeah, I'd like to work on that. That's great, we'll definitely start working on this. <laughs> All right, we we'll take a pause. Um, thank you. Um, what I really liked about this is uh, when she said, would you feel comfortable telling your physical therapist if there was something that you couldn't do? And, you know, we know Amy pretty well now, and she would be. But um, I can think of a lot of newer sclerodermal patients who their physical therapist tells them this is the exercise, and they maybe don't have that conversation about how it's really difficult for them, right? Because the very compliant patient says, okay, they want me to do this, so I should be able to do it, right? They wouldn't give this to me if I wasn't able to do it. But what Amy realizes is that physical therapy isn't always perfectly tailored to her. So I think that that's really important that you as a physical therapist, occupational therapist, say, if you can't do this, 
please be sure to let us know and we'll see if we can come up with a modification because the average patient might think I should be able to do this. Um, we talked about at our table the importance of asking about goals and hobbies, and I thought that was great that you asked that. And she gave you a very specific goal that is one that you can work on. I had no idea that Amy quilted and painted, but how awesome is that? And that's, again, another thing for OT to know about, PT to know about. So really making sure that you find out what's important to your patient. What are your goals for your patient? Not just what do you think is most important. What do they think is most important? And I thought that that was really, really nicely modeled. And, um, and I, I really just want to bring that home to let patients know if, they are, if what you're giving them isn't working for them, they should ask you to help them modify. My name's Kay. I'm in the Family Nurse Practitioner Program here at SAGE. So um, in the realm of nursing, we just uh, do our best to try to help patients to feel the, as best as possible. We do a few different things, coordinate their care, and just really kind of see like where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you, how did you really learn about your condition, what, whether it be like a provider that was really great with you, the computer, um, you know, sometimes people have peer groups or support groups. How did you really kind of hone in on it and figure it out? Um, well, when I was diagnosed, um, I was only 19, so there wasn't really a lot of, I couldn't find a lot of um, information on the internet. So honestly, I did a lot of trial and error myself. Um, and I did a lot of Googling of specific symptoms I was having um, in reference to scleroderma. And I found a great doctor and a team of doctors, like I said uh, earlier, um, who were all specialists, but were also lovers in scleroderma. So that kind of helped me. I think a lot of it's trial and error. Awesome. Um, I was listening when you said that, because earlier you were saying, you know, I really like to take control over myself and what happens. And you were saying that, you know, you do take over 30 pills a day, but possibly 18 medications. Um, and it just like shows how autonomous you are, you know, living with your condition and your resiliency. So I was just wondering, in nursing, we not only care for people, people when they are ill, but we also think about, you know, what do you do to stay well and some preventative measures that you would do from a day-to-day -day basis to just, you know, stay well and take care of yourself? Um, well, um, stay well, I, a lot of it has to do with your environment. Um, if it's cold out, I have to dress appropriately and maybe more appropriately than you or you or you would dress. Um, really bulk up the layers when it's winter out to go outside. Um, you have to kind of make sure you're taking care of your skin. You're looking at all the areas of your body to make sure you don't have a cut or a scrape or a start of a sore. Um, you just have to kind of do your due diligence, make sure you're taking your medications, try to take them at the same time every day. Um, try not to miss any doses, which I think comes with time. And just repetitive, you know, repetitive taking them over and over again. Um, sometimes I'm not hungry, but I have to eat because I'm taking medicine. So I think you just have to try to stay on top of your care and listen to your doctor and try to make the best plan. Hi, I'm Allison. I'm actually an undergrad student here at Sage. Um, so I guess I just have like two big questions since we're running low on time. So I'll ask Sorry. those. Oh no worries. Um, so like, what has your emo emo your emotional journey been like from like when you found out about your diagnosis to like now and like how hard has it been to stay positive? Um, I think when I first found out, uh, I was kind of not really taking it seriously. I felt like I look fine, I feel fine, so um, it can't be that bad. Um, and then. It, as I got older and as I got sicker, I kind of had to um, kind of deal with the fact that maybe this isn't something that I can't just push away. I do definitely feel like with scleroderma, you kind of go through all the stages of grief. You get angry, um, you're in denial, you get mad, you get sad, and then there comes a time when you just kind of accept it. Um, but I think. I've always been positive in the fact that it's something that you can't change. So you just kind of have to 
suck it up and move forward with the things that you can change and things that you can make a difference in and that's how I take care of myself from this point on and making sure I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing to stay healthy. And then, ooh, sorry. And then what do you do like to cope and to stay positive? Like do you, have you ever been to therapy or have you, do you, have, do you just go to your support system? Um, like I said, I have a, a, a pretty tight knit support system, but um, I also um, write articles for an online magazine. I have a support group on social media that I run. Um, I do awareness talks. I volunteer at uh, square room of events, um, go to the movies. Um, I try to just have as much of a normal life as I can um, and try to fit in that box like everybody else does with just normalcy. So, um, and if you have a down day, you have a down day. You know, everybody has down days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. So I was going to stop you and say uh, what Amy does is she shares her journey with all of us, right? That's how Amy clearly copes. And um, we can't thank you enough. Great, great questions. How do you cope? Um, what are your stages, you know? Um, how has it changed? I also like, before I was to ask, saying to you that I like to address how are you getting your education? That is key. So really nice, and asking how are you coping is, is wonderful. And I think that we can, um, that's a great place to end and say thank you, Amy, for coping here with us by giving us this time.